Good evening aspirants. Welcome to Daily News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 29th November 2023. Displayed here are the list of topics we are going to see today. Now let us get into the discussion. Look at this editorial article. Recently our president suggested the creation of All India Judicial Service. Our president made this suggestion hoping that All India Judicial Service will help diversify the judiciary by allowing youngsters from different backgrounds to become judges. through merit based process so the editorial here is written in the response to this suggestion the editorial highlights various issues associated with all india judicial service so in our discussion today we will see the basics about all india judicial service and then we will also discuss the pros and cons associated with it let us start with the basics the concept of all india judicial service refers to establishment of unified recruitment process for the selection of district judges or judges presiding over lower courts across the country see all india judicial service aims to streamline the selection of judges for lower courts through a national level examination the lower courts in this context denote judicial bodies subordinate to supreme court and high courts within the country the implementation of all india judicial service will create a centralized cadre specifically for district judges presently the judges for lower courts are selected by high courts and state governments according to article 233 so the establishment of all india judicial service would transfer the recruitment and appointment authority from the high court and state government directly to a centralized system in india article 312 deals with all india services The original constitution did not have provision for all India judicial service. The idea of all India judicial service was first proposed by 14th report of law commission in 1958. Then all India judicial services was inserted into constitution by 42nd amendment act of 1976 and it was inserted into article 312. According to this article the parliament may by law create an all india service including all india judicial service. But for creating this service a resolution must be passed in the Rajya Sabha with 2/3 of members present and voting. The article also states that all India service may be created only on national interest. So this is the basics about all India judicial service. Now let us see the advantages associated with all India judicial service. Firstly as our president recently mentioned all India judicial service will help diversify the judiciary by allowing bright youngsters from varied backgrounds to become judges and it is done through merit based process so this will enhance the overall efficiency of judiciary secondly this will help increase the judge to population ratio according to law commission report india should have 50 judges per million population but currently india only has 21 judges per million population so this low judge to population ratio is one of the reasons for pending of cases in indian judiciary if all india judicial service is implemented the recruitment of district judges will be streamlined so this will help increase the judge to population ratio and thereby reduce the pendency of cases thirdly all india judicial service will help reduce regional bias so this all india service would create a nation wide pool of qualified judicial candidates finally it will help augment the judicial independence when district judges are recruited to all india judicial services they will be insulated from undue local pressures or influences so this enhances judicial independence so these are some of the advantages with all india judicial services finally let us see the disadvantages or issues with all india judicial services currently the district judges are appointed by governor of the state in consultation with high court of particular state the other judicial officers are appointed by respective state public service commission see the present system is more conducive to ensuring diversity this is because there is a provision for reservation so the editorial states that why should we change something that is not broken so this is the first issue associated with creating all india judicial service secondly there is a issue of understanding local issues for a judge to perform efficiently he must have a clear understanding about the local issues practices and conditions but when the judges are recruited through all india judicial service they might lack a clear understanding about the local issue in addition to this they might not be well versed in the local language as well this is because all india judicial service recruits judges from different parts of india so this might create a problem so this is a second issue thirdly all india judicial service might not attract qualified and talented individuals 
since the number of district judges elevated to high courts is very low many qualified candidates may not sit for national judicial service examination so this lack of career progression will make all india judicial service unattractive for talented individuals lastly there is a lack of acceptance of all india judicial service currently only two high courts agreed to the idea of this all india service while 13 high courts rejected it not just the high courts the state governments will also oppose this idea this is because all india service will lead to more centralization and the states are losing their ground so these are some of the issues associated with all india judicial service so in this discussion we have seen some basics about all india judicial service and advantages and disadvantages associated with it with this we conclude this discussion let us move to the next topic look at this editorial article it talks about 28th conference of parties that is cop28 to united nations framework convention on climate change as you all know cop28 is going to happen from 30th november until 12 december in dubai one of the key agenda of cop28 is going to be global stock take this will evaluate country's progress in climate action so in this news article discussion let us understand the key outcomes of past cop that is cop27 using a mains question as usual so this is the question describe the major outcomes of 27th session of conference of parties to united nations framework convention on climate change what are the commitments made by india in this conference this question can be asked in gs paper 3 under the syllabus conservation environmental pollution see this is a straight forward question so in the introduction you can write what is the purpose of cop and some of the specific information about cop 27 for example cop is a main decision making body of unfccc it includes representatives of all countries that are signatories to unfccc the cop also assess the effects of measures taken by parties and the progress made in achieving the climate objectives cop 27 took place in sham el sheikh in egypt so in this way you can write the introduction now coming to the main body of the answer the body of the answer can be divided into two parts in the first part we are going to write about major outcomes of cop 27 and in the second part we are going to write about the commitments made by india in cop 27 now first let us see the major outcomes of cop 27 Firstly the establishment of dedicated fund for loss and damage see the term loss and damage refer to adverse impact of climate change that are destructive and irreversible which cannot be addressed by mitigation or adaptation measures it includes bush fires species extinction crop failures etc but the issue here is developing countries are the one who contributed very little to climate change but they are most vulnerable to adverse effects of climate change so in order to compensate for the losses faced by developing countries they have come together and created a dedicated fund for loss and damage here the developed countries are primary contributors because they are responsible for historical emissions that polluted the environment secondly countries reaffirmed their commitment to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees celsius above pre-industrial levels by 2030 it is made as a part of a ratchet mechanism here ratchet mechanism means if a country signs an agreement it cannot go back on them so this create opportunity for the world to potentially set itself on a course to stay below 2 degrees celsius third important outcome is holding businesses and institutions accountable to climate change the cop27 slammed the greenwashing technique see greenwashing is an act or practice of making a product that appear to be more environmentally friendly but in reality it is not it is a deceitful strategy used by many companies to increase the sale of product fourthly many steps were taken to mobilize more financial support for developing countries for example reforms to recapitalize development banks and financial institutions like IMF and World Bank were insisted so these reforms will allow the banks to provide more assistance to developing world in their fight against climate change the developed countries are also called upon to make more contributions to green climate fund so these are some of the major outcomes of cop27 now moving on to the second part of the answer here we shall see about india's commitments made during cop27 firstly india committed to enhance its 2015 commitment to reduce the emissions intensity by 45% from 2005 levels by 2030 
India also committed to achieve 50 percentage of energy from renewable energy resources by 2030. Then India committed itself to achieve net zero emissions by 2070 and it announced long term low emission development strategy. This plan focuses on strategic transition of high emission sectors and a discussion of India's climate adaptation needs. See, India is 58th country to submit its plans to UNFCCC. India explicitly conveyed that its coal transition will not be adopted before 2024. India and UNDP jointly launched Lifestyle for Environment program that is LIFE program to protect and preserve the environment. It encourages youth between the age of 18 to 23 years to become the message bearers of sustainable lifestyles. It emphasizes on responsible consumption patterns for this purpose and influence the lifestyle choices to make them more pro-planet people. Thirdly, India committed to generate awareness about climate change and in this regard, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change launched a program called Prayas Se Prabhav Tak which means from mindless conception to mindful utilization. It contains comprehensive collection of information on traditional best practices from India to mitigate climate change. Then India pledged their full support for substantial progress towards establishment of loss and damage fund. India said this in basic ministerial meeting. Here basic is a global grouping of four newly industrialized developing countries which includes Brazil, South Africa, India and China. And India is also part of Mangrove Alliance for Climate. It is an intergovernmental alliance that works on voluntary basis for planting, conserving and restoring mangroves. So these are the some of important commitments made by India during COP27 meeting. So with this, the body part of the answer is over. Now we have come to the conclusion part. COP27 is an important milestone for achieving concrete progress and moving the needle on climate agenda. But still, many needed to be done to keep up with the Paris Agreement goals and keep the temperature limit within 1.5 degrees Celsius. India also did well to preserve its equities at COP27 and in supporting the voice of developing countries. So in this way, you can end the answer in a positive note. So this is all about the discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Look at this news article. Recently, the water along the coast of Puducherry turned red. So the National Green Tribunal formed a committee to analyze the reason for such a color change. So this is about the news article. In this context, let us see some points about red tide. As you know, algae are microscopic organisms that live in aquatic environments. And they are always present in natural bodies like oceans, lakes and rivers. Plus, just like plants, algae also use photosynthesis to produce energy from sunlight. Now when algae grows excessively or rapidly and out of control, then it is called algal bloom. Most of the time, this algal bloom is visible to naked eye because you can see the discoloration of water body. So this is why it is called red tide. Here note that not all the algal blooms are red in color. So not all the red tides are red. The algae color ranges from rusty orange to green to bioluminescent depending on the pigment of cells and local atmospheric conditions. Now what are the causes of red tides? See, red tides are caused due to both natural and anthropogenic factors. First, let us look at the natural factors. The most common natural cause is excessive nutrient availability like nitrogen and phosphorus. So these came from natural sources like runoff from land or upwelling which can lead to rapid growth of algae. So this will also cause red tides. In addition to this, some favorable conditions like warmer water and specific salinity levels can also promote the growth of algae. So these are the natural causes of algal bloom. Now let us look at the anthropogenic factors. The excess entry of nutrients into water body is the main cause of algal bloom. Agricultural runoff, sewage discharge and runoff from lawns containing fertilizers can lead to excess nutrients into coastal waters. So this also leads to algal blooms and red tides. In addition to this, alterations in water temperature and changes in rainfall patterns and increased carbon dioxide in atmosphere due to human induced climate change can also alter the frequency and intensity of algal blooms. So these are the important causes of algal blooms. Finally, let us see the effects of red tides. Firstly, the algal blooms that cause red tide may also produce toxins and these toxins enter into people's bodies through fishes or swimming or drinking the affected water. So this will also cause various 
health effects in humans. Then the red tides affect the marine ecosystem. See, red tides depletes the dissolved oxygen in water. This reduction in dissolved oxygen causes the death of fishes. Also, when a thick layer of red tide is formed above the water, it blocks the entry of sunlight reaching the organisms that live deeper into the water. So this also affects the marine ecosystem. Finally, red tides also negatively impact the economy. As we saw, red tide will affect the marine fish production. It also affects the tourism potential in the area. So these are some of the effects of red tides. And this is all regarding this discussion. Here we have seen basics about red tide. What are the different causes of red tide? And finally, some effects of red tide. With this, let us move to the next topic. Look at this data point. It provides us some facts about progress made in the clean energy transition. This data point came in the light of upcoming UN Climate Summit. Tomorrow, the United Nations Climate Summit, that is COP28, is going to start in Dubai. So, the developing countries like Brazil, South Africa, India and China are demanding for more climate financing and equity. The developing countries are asking to adhere to the concept of common but differentiated responsibilities. This means that rich countries who emitted most greenhouse gases should carry out more activities to address the problem of global warming. See, this is the consistent demand of developing countries and they are pushing this agenda in upcoming summit also. So we have to wait for the outcomes of this summit. Now let us see the data provided in this news article. Look at this chart one. This chart shows the share of clean and fossil fuel sources in power generation. This is shown for BRICS countries between 2000 and 2022. Know that the BRICS currently consist of 11 countries. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Argentina, Ethiopia, Egypt, Iran, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. So these are the countries that comprise BRICS. Now coming to the data, among BRICS countries, China has made drastic reduction in the use of fossil fuels in power generation. In 2000, 82% of power generation in China was made using fossil fuels. But in 2022, the share of fossil fuels has reduced to 65%. Now coming to India, India's progress in clean energy has been relatively slow. Between 2000 and 2022, the share of clean energy in power protection has risen from 17% to 23%. It is just 6% which is relatively slow. The countries like Argentina and Russia are also making slow clean energy transition. Now talking about other countries, among BRICS nations, Saudi Arabia has the highest percentage of fossil fuel usage. For instance, over 99% of Saudi Arabia's power is produced using fossil fuels. Then in countries like South Africa, Iran and Egypt, the share of fossil fuel in power generation is still very high. Then a country like UAE, the clean energy transition has improved after 2020. Here note that Brazil and Ethiopia are the only two countries in BRICS where the share of clean energy in power generation is higher than the share of fossil fuel. In both countries, the clean fuel contributes to over 90% of power generation. In summary, most of the BRICS countries need to increase their share of clean fuel in power generation. So this is all about this chart 1. Now coming to the chart 2. This chart shows the share of clean and fossil fuel sources in power generation of selected Indian states between 2019 and 2022. Here, only the top 15 states in terms of power generation are selected. Among the top 15 states, Gujarat and Rajasthan have recorded a drastic reduction in the usage of fossil fuel. Whereas in the states of Odisha and Punjab, the share of fossil fuel has increased. Of these states, only Karnataka and Himachal Pradesh are having the highest share of clean energy in power generation. So this is all about the data provided in the chart. Now before concluding our discussion, let us see the challenges that affects the process of clean energy transition. The first challenge is high cost. To install cleaner power generation facilities like solar plants and hydroelectric plants, we need huge capital. So this is the first challenge. The second challenge is associated with transmission. Mostly the clean energy sources are dependent on the geographical location, climate and weather. For example, we can source high solar energy where there is optimum and high sunlight. Likewise, we need water abundant regions to generate hydropower. So transmitting this power to other areas is a big challenge. Apart from this, connecting renewable sources to power grid 
is a major issue in terms of cost and efficiency. The third challenge is regarding energy storage. The renewable energy such as wind energy and solar energy require storage technologies to ensure consistent supply. And the final challenge is geopolitical crisis. Some of the crises like Russia-Ukraine war, Hamas-Israel conflict and COVID-19 have complicated the process of cleaner transition energy. So these are some of the important challenges in clean energy transition. So with this we conclude this discussion. Let us move to the next topic. Look at this news article. According to the article, yesterday a tiger was tranquilized and captured from Hediala range of Bandipur National Park. So in this news article discussion, let us understand about the basics of tiger in prelims exam perspective. Firstly know that there were 8 subspecies of tiger that existed in the past. Out of these 8, 3 have gone extinct for many years. Those 3 extinct subspecies were Bali tiger, Javan tiger and Caspian tiger. Only 5 subspecies of tiger exist today and they were Indian tiger or Royal Bengal tiger, Indo-Chinese tiger, Siberian or Amur tiger, Sumatran tiger, South China tiger. Note that recent reports indicate that this South China tiger is also extinct in the wild. We shall see about Indian tiger or Royal Bengal tiger in this discussion. The Royal Bengal tiger is the largest member of cat family. It has a thick yellow coat with dark stripes. It weighs around 135 to 280 kilograms. The average lifespan of tiger is about 14 to 16 years. It is found throughout the country except in northwestern region. Also, it is found in neighboring countries like Nepal, Bhutan and Bangladesh. The diet of Indian tiger mainly consists of large wild animals like Chital, Sambar, Barasinga, Nilagai and Guar. These tigers are found in variety of habits including tropical and subtropical forest, evergreen forest, mangrove swamps and grasslands. The tiger census is conducted at regular intervals that is once in every four years. Now talking about the conservation status of tiger. See Indian tiger is an endangered animal and it is listed in Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. This act gives a protection against hunting and poaching and trading of the animal. Any person who commits such offence is punishable with the imprisonment of 3 to 7 years. It is also listed in Appendix 1 of Sites. So this is about the conservation status of tiger. Now we have come to the prelims practice question discussion. Look at the first question. It is about Royal Bengal tiger. Look at the first statement. It is found only in West Bengal in India. See this statement is obviously incorrect because it is found throughout the country except in northwestern region as we have seen this in discussion. And note that it is also found in the countries like Nepal, Bhutan and Bangladesh. So the first statement is incorrect. Now look at the second statement. Hunting Royal Bengal Tiger can lead to punishments up to imprisonment of 3 to 7 years. Yes, this statement is correct. As we all know, the tiger is protected under Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Now coming to the third statement. Nagarjuna Sagar Sri Salem is one among the critical tiger habitat. Yes, this statement is correct. It is also the largest critical tiger habitat in the country. So only two statements are correct and our answer is option B. Only two. Now moving on to the second question. It is about algal blooms. It is a previous year question. There is a concern over the increase in harmful algal blooms in the sea waters of India. What could be the causative factors for this phenomenon? The first statement is discharge of nutrients from the estuaries. The second statement is a runoff from the land during the monsoon. The third statement is upwelling in the seas. See all these three statements are correct because the algal blooms are caused by all the three reasons. So the correct answer is option D. These are the main question for you today. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section. With this we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IS YouTube channel. Thank you.